It is my privilege to welcome you, fellows, supervisors, colleagues, families, friends, partners, to the 2023 High Road and Democracy Summer Showcase. I'd like to begin with a territorial acknowledgement. In keeping with regional protocol, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee by honoring sovereignty of six nations, Mohawk, Cayuga, Onondaga, Oneida, Seneca, Tuscarora, and their land where we are situated and where the majority of our work takes place. In this acknowledgement, we hope to demonstrate respect for treaties that were made on territories and remorse for the harms and mistakes of the far and recent past. And we pledge to work towards partnership with a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. And in honoring the opening of many of our Haudenosaunee gatherings, I'd like to begin and later end with part of our Thanksgiving address. Today we have gathered and we see that the cycles of life continue. We have been given the duty to live in balance and harmony with each other and with all living things. So now we bring our minds together as one and we give greetings and thanks to each other as people. Thank you. As I said, I ended the acknowledgement with what we call the Gunan Yoke. It's a Thanksgiving address, an expression of gratitude. I'd like to greet our friends who are joining us via Zoom. We are using no less than 15 different types of technology today. So shout out to Anna for all of her help. <laughs> And those of you who joined us in person, I want to take a moment and encourage you to look to your left, to your right, in front, and behind you, and greet your fellow humans. I'll give you a second. Was that a little uncomfortable? Um, it sometimes is for me, and I'm not really sure why. Um, at the beginning of this summer, we told these 21 fellows we were going to make them a little uncomfortable. We wanted to push them outside of their comfort zones, not completely, not unsafely, just 10% at a time. Because if we aren't pushing ourselves and each other, then we're just staying inside our bubbles and we certainly aren't growing. For those of you who might be less familiar with the program, each summer for the last 15, about 20 undergraduates from Cornell join us here in Buffalo, our home sweet home, and work with elected officials and nonprofit partners networked with PPG. So thank you to PPG and the team for all of your support and patience with us for taking over on Fridays. And this fellowship would not be possible without our partners in Ithaca. Through research, teaching, community engagement, colleagues at Cornell University and the ILR School provided fellows with foundational knowledge necessary to contextualize their summer experience. Prior to their arrival, our fellows participated in pre-course, introducing them to social sector organizations, economic development theory, and Buffalo's assets and challenges. Kathy and I laugh a little when in week two of the pre-course, we received very formal emails like, Dear Professors Kazak and Creighton, I am writing to request. Because little do these students know that in two months' time, they will be regularly calling us, texting us, emailing us at all hours of the day, things like, and I could not make this up if I tried, high road memes that they created, selfies in front of Buffalo landmarks, and even the occasional request to pick them up from Canada because their Uber accidentally took them there. These fellows lived and worked and played and biked and ate lots of chicken wings, vegetarian fare, witnessed a grand slam under the fireworks sky and contributed to these community-driven solutions to some of the region's most pressing problems. For the last 15 years, every cohort of fellows has been unique and this year was no exception. This incredible group was really awful at taking group photos, but you know, as a whole was quieter and a bit more reflective than previous years. I'm not sure they would self-identify this way, given their propensity for Shakira nights, dressing up to see Barbie, their backyard performances, but here we are. They were a group that expressed gratitude in innumerable ways, and I think this is also a testament to the people who raised them and their support networks. So in the spirit of gratitude, supervisors, thank you. Thank you to the network of community and civic leaders, activists, artists, educators, experts, who participated in all of our many high road programs. Many of you are here today. From welcoming students to the city of Buffalo, providing them with knowledge of what it's like to live in the Rust Belt, and inviting them to engage in real community level change, Partners in Buffalo offered fellows the opportunity to put key lessons learned at Cornell University into practice. Our indigenous communities refer to seven generations when we orient our work and decision-making, recognizing the efforts of the three generations before ours, our current one, and the three to come. 
While much of our collective work is about the here and now, we also consider implications for the future. Supervisors and partners, we see and appreciate the work you do every single day and recognize the extra effort it takes to support the next generation of community change makers. So thank you. Families, partners, support networks of our fellows. I'm going to lean, in my un lean into my unofficial title of a fellowship mom, snacks, sunscreen, water, I get it friends, because I am in fact a mom. I still hold my breath when I let my three-year-old climb by herself on the playground that little pit in your stomach that wants to make sure they're okay. I might not know what it's like yet to send my child to an unfamiliar city with people I've never met, but I promise you, Kathy and I in our village in Buffalo did our best to support these young folks as if they were our own, with only a few minor bonks and skin knees along the way. And fellows, thank you for sharing your talents with us, for critically thinking, for reflecting every week, for challenging ideas, reinforcing the importance of why we do work for the collective good. You teach us not just about Trader Joe's frozen hash browns and that she ate, slay, and bussin are good things, you know, but you teach us new ways of thinking. You re-inspire us to fight the good fight. This fellowship is not merely performing acts of service. It's about developing a critical awareness of structural obstacles to equality, equity, and justice and working to dismantle intersecting forms of economic, racial, gender, and other oppression. You fought against massive racial inequalities, income inequities, climate change, unethical corporations, big commercial producers. You fought for equity and workers' rights, sustainability, justice, art, and for a very democracy. Fellows, after today, you joined the ranks of over 250 High Road alumni from six Cornell colleges, 29 states, and seven countries. You demonstrated commitment to Buffalo Niagara region, our home, and you made it a better place. You become part of a long line of people who choose the high road, who say they care about something bigger than themselves. This graduation showcase is a little unconventional. You know, we ask fellows to share their biggest takeaways from the summer, not necessarily to present their findings, summarize their data, or list all of their accomplishments. To be frank, their work speaks for itself. What we ask is a little bit trickier, possibly a little bit more uncomfortable, to share how they felt and what they learned. The High Road Fellowship believes that art in all its forms has the power to incite social change, community reflection, and mutual understanding. We did a lot. Every week, we start with an art, arts opener. I wanted to share this beautiful piece of art. As an econ major my senior year, I found myself in a very strange place, a sociology class. It was random, seemingly inconsequential Tuesday. When the curtain was lifted and I asked my 70-year-old self-proclaimed wonky professor, so you're saying we're all just puppets in these systems that were created? So what are we supposed to do to change them? Expecting to be told exactly what to do, very naive, I know. He said, ah, that is the question you will spend your whole life answering. So fellows and really everyone here, whether you decide to make changes from the inside or the outside, whatever you decide to do, we hope that you remember as we said on day one that you have the potential to do incredible things and that you already have. Fellows, we hope that when you find yourself in a strange new place, you remember that you once felt that way about Buffalo and that it takes just a little bit of effort, maybe 10% at a time, to do things you never thought you could do. So thank you for loving our home as much as we do, even if you, as difficult it is for me to say this, do not love our pizza. So to bring it for full circle, I'd like to remind you of what Lou Jean Fleuron, former director of our Buffalo CoLab and founder of the High Road Fellowship, challenged us to do, to choose the high road again and again and again. As she quoted Angela Davis, you have to act as if it were possible to radically transform the world, and you have to do it all the time. And with that, I'd like to invite our first fellow, Shira Tutu, to present. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> uh, my name is Inshira. I'm a healthcare policy major at Cornell, and this summer I was working at Ujima Theater Company, um, and I had the pleasure of working with them to do the research and planning for a theater program for justice-impacted people. However, I thought that it would be smart of me to talk about the life and legacy of the late Miss Lorna C. Hill, just because there is no Ujima and no research project without her. 
And so I wanted to begin by showing a video of her from 1978 in which she talks about her, her dreams and her visions for starting Ujima um, and, and the work that she hoped to do with the people that she was starting it with. So. We spoke with Ujima Company's founder and director. Warner Ujima Hill. Company is a vision of mine. It's the end result of several years of wanting to do serious theater group with a uh, theater with a group of seriously committed actors and actresses. Okay, so that is why a repertory company, having people in training to achieve a professional status which allows us then to do professional theater. We don't have professional theater of a black nature in Buffalo. We have community theater but not professional theater and that was that is my goal. By her um, and much of Ujima's success can be attributed to her and the work that she did. The late Lorna was so many things. She wore many titles and she had many hats. She was an actress, a poet, a playwright, a director, a champion of change, a civic leader, um, a mentor to so many people, a teacher. She was the first black woman to graduate from Dartmouth and one of the first women to ever be accepted into Dartmouth College. And she created Ujima to stimulate the public conscience, um, to inspire people to ask you know, critical questions about the world around them, think critically about the society that we live in and, and wonder what we can do to make it a better place. Um, some of the, uh, Ujima's most popular works during her tenure include El Haj Malik, which was a biographical play that she wrote about Malcolm X, and Yala Bitch, which was her own autobiographical play. Um, she sparked meaningful conversation in community long before 2020 in this racial awakening that this world seemed to have. Um, she, she helped us learn more about climate injustice, economic injustice, environmental racism, so many things. And she really spearheaded the conversations in Buffalo. And I think I learned a lot from her just in the work that she did and being able to hear about that. Um, and, sorry, um, this summer we talked a lot in the high road about art as a vehicle for social change and the late Miss Lorna who passed away in 2020 um, and Ujima are living embodiments of that. Um, Ujima strives in the work that they do to, as I was saying before, you know, have those hard conversations, inspire people to think critically about the world around them. Um, and I think a lot can be learned from her about the work that she does through the arts um, to inspire social change. Um, and in this time of transition since her passing in 2020, um, everyone at Ujima has been very intentional about um, you know, making sure that we can transition well and continue her legacy and make sure that, you know, the next phase of Ujima without her can be just as great as its phase with her. Um, and so I wanted to end with a video of her from 2016 at the launch of the Crossroads Coalition, um, which is a coalition of Buffalo organizations that work together to combat climate, economic, and racial injustice and bring about a just transition um, that simulates and, and promotes a community economy here in Buffalo. And I'll play it. Good morning. My name is Lorna Hill. I'm the artistic director, founder of Ujima Company. And my role this morning is to assure you that artistic and cultural expression is integral to this movement. Art and social change are soul mates. Art challenges, awakens, and stirs different parts of us so that we are motivated to transcend the status quo and reimagine our future. The Crossroads Collective believes in cultural and creative expression as a means to affect deep and lasting social change. Through art, we can challenge many of our society's deepest assumptions. We can spark new ideas. We can catalyze critical thinking, elicit new actions, inspire individuals, and create. Thank you so much for listening, and I will now pass it off to Ava Gegi. I don't. 
don't have 66 things to say about them. But I do have a few. So today, I wanted to share a few of my favorite quotes from Rossi's original work before proposing a few axioms of my own. So first, I choose all the way. When you do something, do it all the way. This is something that's true in pretty much every aspect of life. But one thing that I've learned in working with media is that effort is always noticed, even when you think no one is watching. And putting in that effort eventually builds trust, which is the foundation for good organizing. Next, I chose if you think you can do it for people, you've stopped understanding what it means to be an organizer. Obviously, different people have different organizing strategies, but I believe that it's a big mistake to rely entirely on sending your own people into the shop and trying to get workers to sign into a free sign of culture. If you think you know better than the people that actually work in the shop what they need, you're eventually going to lose sight of what's at stake and what really matters to those people. So next, I wrote from the heart a quote. How can you move others in this world you serve? I think something that can be missing from labor is energy and excitement. And so it's up to us to bring in that heart into the work that we all choose to do in the future. Okay, the slides are not much here, but I do want to read them. <laughs> so the first one that I wrote is love. People are wrong, defend them anyway. As much as we want to think everybody that we work with are perfect angels and haven't done anything wrong, the reality is that they're people and so they make mistakes just like anybody else. A lot of the work that we do is dealing with people that have made mistakes, whether they just lost their job or they really messed up at work and so they need support from the union. We might not always agree with the actions that the people we represent have taken, but it's not our role to make a judgment. It's our job to help them, even when that's difficult. Next, I have real recognized be straight up with the people that you work with. I'm a huge people pleaser, so it can be really difficult for me to tell someone that there's not much that I can do for them in terms of union representation, but being honest and straightforward from the beginning will save so much heartbreak down the line in terms of false hope and false expectations. We expect a certain level of honesty and transparency from our members, and they deserve that in return. Next, I have trust. No one from management, <laughs> most people from your union, and always yourself. This one is self-explanatory. <laughs> but I do think it's important to recognize that you have to trust yourself before you can get other people to trust you. Finally, I wrote, do the work, know the work. Many of us as hiring fellows will spend four years in the classroom learning about labor relations and hypothetically unions and contracts and bargaining. But what I found is that nothing better prepares you to do organizing work than experience in that work yourself. And so it's incredibly special to have a team that has a blend of people from backgrounds and perspectives like the Nursing Home Division at 1199. And I've been extraordinarily lucky to learn from the people who have had that experience. And so those of us that have not must do the work to learn the work from people that know the work. So thank you guys all so much. I've had an incredible summer. I want to really quickly specifically thank Grace, Manny, Alina, Darlene, Xavier, Peter, and everybody else at 1199. And Tricky's about to pull me off the stage. So I'm going to pass it off to my cousin.
in the back. That's my coworker. This is Jamie. Let's see in the back. Look at that. See that? That's him. Alright. Alright, yeah. So um this summer, I want to talk about the work unit. So this summer, I worked on this property since I've been needed. You know, I was I was there and my trips with the young men, we did trips to the Saturday to different locations, different parks, so I just throw that up. That's a picture of us. So, you know, these trips are for the young men to gain different experiences, to get them outside their comfort zone. I talked about earlier that if you're not in your comfort zone, you're not making progress. And progress is just perpetually doing the road, and that's what it is. And that's what's important, so it's right, so it's a path, right? Um, so, you know, I was out there in the field, and I was doing the work, and the trips, and all that. So, that was really an enjoyable experience. But another thing I did this summer was I worked on this project called Where Are They Now? And essentially, what I did was track the progress of so many three program alumni and see how Rick and Mary is coming together and where they are now. And, you know, in talking to all these young men, and even the first one was really my experience, but I asked them the same set of similar ask questions. One of the questions I asked is, what does breaking barriers mean to you? Right? And, you know, when you ask that question to so many people, you start to think, what does it mean to me? So that's what I'd like to talk about today, and I guess to really summarize that, I'd like to talk about the experience that I had on the trips that we so, like on my first week, we went to this trip at Meadows Hole. If you know about Meadows Hole, it's a very arduous, treacherous trip. Uh, it's 300 steps down, it's just 300 steps down, it's 300 steps back up. Uh, which is a little crazy for a good person, so difficult. So, you know, it was a little bit difficult for me, but I made it through. Um, but, you know, there is this the one kid who came along the trip with us. He was a bit more heavy set. He hadn't, you know, been out of the house. And there, there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, you know, there's systems behind all those issues, right? Um, so, you know, he didn't get out the house much, but, you know, he was on the trip with us, and it was his first time hiking. It was a beautiful experience for him. You know, so when he was coming down, it, it, was, all, it was all good. But when we were on the way back up, it got a little bit more difficult. And he started panting. He's like, oh, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this. And I was like, no, yes, you can, you can do it. You know, but me saying that wasn't enough. And then I was challenged, and I was like, whoa, whoa, what do I do here? Um, so I guess, you know, the simplest thing is often the best thing. So I took his hand, put it around my shoulder, and uh, walked with him. Every step that he took was one I took as well. And, you know, I think that was the best thing I could have done in that situation. So, you know, I kept encouraging him, words of affirmation, those are great. But I walked with him. I was with him every step of the way. Every experience that he had, I had too. And, you know, that's, that was so beautiful to me. And, you know, we, he gave up many times. I wanted to give up sometimes because he was giving up so many times. But, you know, we made it to the top. And he, I was proud of him, but more importantly, he was proud. And when he has an, another problem in his life, whenever he has any challenge, he can look back on that moment and say, I did this so I can do this too. And I think that's what motivates us every single day uh, to keep going forward. And I'm, I'm blessed to have been a part of that experience. So, you know, uh, let me just show you some other pictures. We took them on the trail. I took all these pictures, so that's me. I'm a photographer, hire me. Um, but, you know, it, it was a blessed experience. And, you know, just, just in closing, um, a good thing means many things to many different people. All the people I interviewed this summer, they had a different answer for what breaking barriers means to them. And, I, you know, and considering the, this question, I do too. Breaking barriers is expanding your capacity as well, also expanding the, your own capacity with others, right? It's learning and teaching others, but learning with them and teaching yourself as well. I mentored many kids over this summer, but I also mentored myself. And it sounds a bit cliche, but there's, I couldn't say any more genuine and truer words. Um, so Breaking Barriers is a beautiful program. I encourage all of you to donate, support Breaking Barriers. Um, but in closing, I just want to thank my advisor, Mr. Daniel Robertson, my coworker, Mr. Jamin Utsi, and he's not here today, but I want to thank Pastor Tommy as well. Um, I'd be remiss, I'm a religious man, so I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the Bible. The Bible talks about a friend that sits closer than a brother. And if you could stand up for me, those, those two men back there are friends that sit closer than brothers. And I'm, I'm glad that I can call myself a part of Breaking Barriers officially. And I'm, I'm really blessed to have done so. So thank you. And thank you. My name is Laura, and I'm a junior studying environment and sustainability and information science. Um, this summer, I spent time at Field and Ford. Oh, can you hear me now? A little bit. 
<laughs> okay, should I start over? Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Laura, and I am a junior studying environment and sustainability and information science at Cornell. This summer, I spent time working at Field and Fork on policy and advocacy. So today, I thought I'd share a video telling you a little bit about what I learned. So enjoy. <laughs> Throughout my time at Field and Fort in the summer, I got to see lots of different things going on in Buffalo and beyond. I attended different events like press conferences, events at the city market, and the map truck lunch. I also got to see Niagara Falls. I worked on a few different projects. So, today, the first, I did serving and outreach in the Niagara Falls community. I also did research in organizations and partners for Field and Fort. And finally, I did research on best practices for the urban space. And so today I'll be reflecting on what I learned about community engagement using a popular group category. The first lesson I learned is about bringing people together. Stone soup is a big tale I heard when I was younger. In the version that I know, a toddler comes to a village and they put a stone into a pot and they say, I'm going to make stone soup. The villagers have never heard of stone soup and they start to gather around. Out of fascination, people start to share their food, giving the ingredients they have to the traveler. Eventually, it makes a really delicious soup that everyone shares. It might not be the best analogy necessarily for community organizing since the traveler tricks the villagers into giving in their food, but I think it also points out some really important things about bringing a community together. It's really important to know who exactly is in your community and what ingredients you have to put in the soup you're cooking up. This summer, I did a lot of work to figure out who is impacted by our work, who can make a difference, and whose voice has been left out through a process called stakeholder mapping. I found a lot of new people and institutions that you might not initially expect to be involved, but really should have a voice. By recognizing who is here, we can help to create leaders who have a deep knowledge of their community. The second lesson I learned was all about creating accessible spaces. So alphabet soup agencies is a term that came out of the FDR administration to describe all the different agencies and the different acronyms that came out of the programs he created. When I first came to Field and Fork, there was a lot of new vocabulary and organizations. Not all of them were necessarily acronyms, but a lot of them were terms the majority of people don't know. I had the time to learn it all this summer, or at least some of it, but that's not the case for everyone. When we engage people, it's important to reduce jargon, otherwise it's easy for people to feel like there's no space for them within the movement. Finally, I learned about creating solutions for everyone. At home, I love to have hot pot nights with my family. Hot pot isn't technically a soup, but it kind of fits into the category. Um, during our hot pot nights, we sit around the table and prepare a bunch of veggies and tofu. My mom also makes this really delicious peanut butter and sesame sauce. Hot pot requires really different ingredients than the traditional stone soup from the story, and that is the case with a lot of different foods from a lot of different cultures. When we work on food access, it's important to keep in mind different cultures, and in general that there are many different ways of being and living to take into account. For example, when I did serving this summer, we had to go through different avenues to make sure we represented the Niagara Falls community. We put up posters, put posts up on social media, and we did in-person dot surveying. And this is a super micro example of considering how people move and interact. But in general, by having a clear understanding and appreciation, we can implement zoomed in and focused solutions based in the place and the people. Food can bring people together, but only when we make an effort to involve everyone. The food system and its flaws often seem really big and complex, at least to me, but through my two months here, I saw so many allies and people who were interested and actively involved. So I feel like the summer has made me much more hopeful in the process of creating ripples and changes in our food system. Hi, I'm Pranati Charasala, and I am in the ILR school, 
I had my placement this summer at the Center for Urban Studies, and today I'll be talking about gentrification and displacement through the history of Central Park and how that story relates to Buffalo. So, as we all know, Central Park is a very large urban park in Manhattan, New York City. It was the country's first urban landscape park built in 1858, but planning began in 1853. And this was in response to a rapidly growing population in New York City. And in fact, the population had quadrupled between 1825 and the 1870s. Therefore, because of such a largely growing and densely populated city, the city's elite class believed that it would lose its green spaces. And through that fear, Central Park was born. However, when Central Park was planned, it was not planned on an already existing landscape. It required to push out an existing village, and this village was called Seneca Village. It hosted around only 200 black residents, but at the time, it was the largest village of free African-American property owners before the Civil War ended. And this was a huge deal because during the time, not a lot of freed black people had the civil rights that property ownership afforded them. However, there was a very popular narrative around Central Park. Central Park was touted as being a good public investment, a public investment that would bring happiness and greenery and all the economic um, uh, opportunities to Manhattan. However, because of such a narrative, the narrative around Seneca Village was therefore very negative. Because this village was integrated, it had black people, it had Irish, German immigrants, uh, it had schools, uh, churches for everybody in the village, it was considered a squatter settlement and it was considered a shantytown basically delegitimizing those who lived there and basically calling them homeless people that were mooching off the land that didn't even belong to them. So what does this story have to do with Buffalo? Well, here I have a map of a neighborhood on the east side of Buffalo called the Fruit Belt. And on the left of that red line there is the medical campus that borders directly on this neighborhood. The Fruit Belt is a majority African-American and low-income neighborhood. So how does this public investment, this investment that has been characterized as a public good, the medical campus, affected the Fruit Belt area? Here I have a map of some statistics, and as we see here, it was not exactly a public good. In 2000, the medical campus was built, and that's when we see a steady decline of the African-American population in the Fruit Belt. In 2000, there was a 90% black population in the Fruit Belt, and 23 years later, now, it's 73%. But most notably is how the poverty rate went down from 43% to just 16% in the last 20 years. This seems like a great thing. This does seem like the medical campus brought the investment and the opportunities that it said it would. However, what this actually means is that the black population has been steadily being pushed out of their own homes as a majority non-black and much wealthier residents move in to the Fruit Belt in order to live close to the medical campus. For example, many doctors who might want to work at the medical campus, they have been increasing the rents and they're therefore making it impossible to live in their homes, the places that they grew up in. So what can we learn from these two stories? Although the medical campus is not Seneca Village or Central Park, although eminent domain was, is not used in the Fruit Belt to completely destroy the neighborhood right now, what we learn is that both of these investments are not good investments, and not all investments are good. A narrative might twist one's words and characterize any kind of building or any kind of business that brings any kind of money to a place as a good investment, but that's not always the case. And in fact, many of these investments lead to gentrification, and gentrification always leads to some type of displacement. But there is hope. 
out of all the research that I did with the Center for Urban Studies, I learned that community organizing has to be the number one step in fighting gentrification. In using methods such as surveying and going to community members and finding out what they actually need in their own communities, we can find out what a good investment is. For example, the Fruit Belt population would probably say that they need affordable homes, and affordable homes would therefore be a good investment. But that is a discussion that would require a lot more time. But I know that with everyone here today and all the organizations represented here today, we all value community organizing and community input. And I know with those processes and with those beliefs, we can finally build trust in these neighborhoods and on the east side and the fruit belt and finally make these places considered a great place to live, especially for the residents that are already there. Thank you. And next. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Okay, cool. I'm Maddie Ficio, I'm a senior studying psychology at Cornell, and this summer I worked with the Center for Self-Advocacy, which is an organization that provides services and resources for people with disabilities in the Buffalo community. So, I decided to model my presentation today after the show Adventure Time, which... <laughs> Um, has episodes that are called Five Short Grables, and they basically break it down into five tiny separate stories and then tie them all together at the end. So, Five Short CS Ables will be my presentation. So my primary work this summer was on the Let's Connect project, which is a digital equity program that helps people with disabilities learn how to use computers in ways that are actually relevant to them. Um, so I was able to help develop the curriculum and make the presentations for that program. Here are some examples of the probably 500 slides that I made for that program. Um, and as you can see here, it covers everything from how to get on the internet, how to use a browser, all of that, to social media and online shopping and accessibility features that are available on your computer. So. I also helped host our Let's Talk series, which is a series of support groups. They meet usually once a week, um, and they're on a variety of different topics where people from the community can come in. They're held online, so they're accessible, and they can talk about things that are relevant to them, their experiences. We have a group on living in the community. We have a disability and identity group, um, and it was really a, an honor to be able to help host those. I also had the privilege of going to the Self-Advocacy of New York State Regional Conference, which is a region-wide um, conference that about, I think, 300 people attended. Maddie is nodding at me. <laughs> um, and I took these photos and also these. You can see my supervisor, Sam, in the bottom right corner who hates when I take his picture. Um, and I got to listen to several different workshops about all different topics um, that are relevant to people in the disability community in our region. Um, we talked about diversity, transportation, basically everything that you can think of um, and problems that people are actually facing and what they want to see change in. I also had what is now known at CSA as our city hall adventure, um, which is that my supervisor Sam and I were traveling to city hall to meet with a representative to talk about getting transportation for the disability pride celebration, which I will talk about next. Um, and ironically, we had a transportation nightmare getting to city hall to have that meeting. Um, we intended to take the bus, but of course, as the Buffalo weather loves to do, we could not do that because of the rain. Um, so we had to figure out a ride. We got to City Hall, had to circle around the building probably five times trying to find somewhere to park. Got inside. The security guard at the door made a very weird condescending comment to Sam about how it's so nice to have a nice young lady to chaperone him. And I was like, that's 
weird and unnecessary. Um, we finally had our meeting. They promised us um, all kinds of transportation, paratransit available for the Disability Pride celebration, assured us everything would be great, and turned out that was not true. But I still got to go to the Disability Pride celebration, which was um, on the 33rd anniversary of the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. And we had a flag raising of the Disability Pride flag, which you can see in the bottom right corner there. Um, heard speeches from different members of the community, including Sam, again, in the top left corner. Um, we heard from the mayor, we heard from different government officials about how the ADA has affected people with disabilities and how much work we still have to go. So what is the point that ties all of these things together? We talked a lot this summer about meaningful change and how we can actually make that in a community, how you go about that. And my work with CSA has really solidified the idea that I had at the beginning of the summer, which is that if you want to make meaningful change in and for a community, the only way to do that is by prioritizing the people who are actually in that community. There is a lot of movements that get taken over by debatably well-meaning politicians um, that want to do the best they can for that community and invest and they end up speaking over the people who are actually affected and who might have completely different ideas of what they need because that is their lived experience. I saw plenty of that this summer, but I also got to be in spaces that were made by people with disabilities for people with disabilities and that was where I saw what that community actually is prioritizing and what they want to do and seeing that advocacy in action was by far the most meaningful part of my summer. So I will end on that point, which is if you want to make change in a community, if you're not part of that community, listen. Thank you. Okay.
which steers you to the bus, because the bus never actually pulls up to the curb fully or lowers the rear of the bus, so she's afraid of falling off when she gets off. These types of stories are the ones that can actually illustrate the problem of public transportation in Buffalo, not the statistics and data that we Cornell students are used to. So, how do we go about surveying in a way that can actually collect these stories? Well, my first tip is don't assume that respondents can read. In the city of Buffalo, 30% of adults are considered functionally illiterate. That's 10% above the national average. And when I was surveying respondents at the library downtown, I realized that a lot of the people I approached weren't able to fully complete the survey because of this problem. Yet our society has shamed illiteracy to the point that people are too embarrassed to ask for help. So. When I began approaching people, I added a simple sentence to my request, which is, I do these surveys all the time. I can really quickly read them to you if that would help, which is a quick and easy way to accommodate your respondents without making them feel ashamed. Do create a diverse sa uh, sample. Now, we all have our own implicit biases that affect the way that we approach certain people within a crowd. And I did this my first couple of weeks as well, where I realized I was going up to people that felt familiar to me or looked like me, because it was just easy to do that. But if we can randomize our approach, and if we can go up to crowds in a way that we could approach everyone who is in that crowd, then we can actually get a diverse set of stories instead of the same types of respondents over and over. Don't be inconsistent. It sounds silly, but changing the way that we talk, our tone, and changing the question that we ask people can change the response that they give us. If we have a negative tone about the system and complain about public transportation, which you should, but that can actually influence the way that people respond. And finally, create trust. Be understanding. Some people have had a horrible day and are gonna tell you to get the F out of your face. Other people want to overshare and tell you their entire life story before they even begin filling out their zip code. Regardless of where a respondent falls on this spectrum, be understanding, because someone who's willing to share their experiences with you is someone who knows that their time is being valued by you. And so I'm not an ex expert of surveys per se, but I can say that a measure of a good survey is one that collects stories. And finally, I wanna say thank you to my supervisor, Kate Lockhart, Thank you for making me feel welcome in the city of Buffalo for my first summer away from home. And thank you for giving me a great example of what passion looks like. And finally, for the last time this summer, I'm going to ask if you do use public transportation and have a quick minute to, throughout the day, I'd love if you could fill out our survey. <laughs> And now I'll pass it on to Logan Hanchett. Good morning. Good morning, I'm Logan Hanchett. I'm an urban and regional studies major at Cornell. I'm from Bloomington, Indiana, and I spent the summer with shared mobility. Today I'll be presenting about bikes and poems. There's a poetic rhythm to the bicycle. With each turn of the legs, you pedal your way to the final destination. I did exactly that many times this summer, as I biked more than 200 miles on a ready bike. On the right, it shows a map of some of my recent trips. On the left is me tabling. I tabled lots of community engagement events with Simon, demonstrating how bike share works to people. And on the right is me tabling at the launch of our Western New York e-bike library up in Niagara Falls. That's where we lend out e-bikes to people on a two-week basis. So some takeaways from the summer. Just from my own experience biking around, talking in the community, and tabling events, are that Ready Bike Share changes transportation habits to make them more sustainable. It reduces the reliance on cars. Second, it solves gaps in the transportation system, making the whole thing more accessible. Specifically, it solves the problem of last mile connections, the gap from public transit to the final destination. And third, it contributes to economic development, leaving an impact. It does this in two ways. First off, you can name stations after businesses, which is great for marketing. And second, it's easy to stop and shop because you're on a bicycle. So as part of the high road, we had to submit weekly journals. I wrote a poem every week. And here's one from week four. Where the Niagara River's roar resounds, the Queen City fits the crown. Buffalo city renowned, 
Its industrial skeleton remains, once lush with labor, now its core hollowed out. Here yet forgotten, full of nothing, full of stories. Walls standing in silent repose, ghost of labor's past nobody knows. Industry has since moved on, its footprint sings a somber song. Buffalo's got a spirit, it never subsides, admits to decay resilience resides. The comeback city well on its way. Welcome to Buffalo, that's what they say. So I didn't just write poems this summer, I also organized a social media campaign called Ready, Set, Guess. The purpose of it was to increase engagement, to highlight exploration possibilities and localize marketing efforts. Main takeaway is never be afraid to give it a whack. Speak up when you have a great idea and say something because it might just get scheduled through September like my post did. <laughs> Here's an example of some of those posts. And finally, I closed out my summer by researching e-bike libraries. So what is an e-bike library? Well, it's just like a public library. It allows you to borrow an e-bike free of charge. Each community-based organization takes on the responsibility of programming the library, and Shared Mobility donates the bikes to the community-based organization. So how is it possible? First off, the disposal of 3,000 e-bikes from Uber's exit. Second, the support of independent health and Ralph Wilson Jr. legacy funds. And third, the work of SMI staff on the ground every single day to fix up these e-bikes. So why should an organization start an e-bike library? First off, it's an asset for organizations. It lenders you legitimacy, which is key for securing grants and stakeholder support. Second, it engages the community, which fulfills your purpose as a community-based organization. It, we, the uh, the community-based organization becomes a central hub for both interpersonal and transportation-related connection. And third, it improves neighborhood mobility, which is good for the greater good. It will foster camaraderie and community throughout the neighborhood. Um, yeah. This is the team I worked with over the summer. I'm very thankful and grateful to have had the opportunity to learn from all of these wonderful people. My supervisor, Simon, in the back there, too. <laughs> and one last poem to close it out. I'm going to let you guys read this one, and then I'm going to pass it over to Sophia Maslova. My name is Sophia. Oh, hold on. Sorry. <laughs> Hello. Is this a good volume? Okay. My name is Sophia Maslova. I'm a senior human development major, and this summer I worked in community education and refugee services at Jewish Family Services of Western New York. I want to start off by thanking my supervisor, Jill Gavin, my coworker, Aaron Fisher, and everyone else who oriented me to this work. Today I'm going to speak about cultural orientation or how to run multilingual group programming for non-English speakers. A large chunk of my summer was spent learning about cultural orientation and helping out with certain aspects of running it. Now, let's talk about refugees in Buffalo. Every year, up to 2,000 refugees are resettled in the Buffalo Niagara region. Jewish Family Services is one of four refugee resettlement organizations here. All refugees in the United States receive services from an organization such as JFS for 90 days. And one of these crucial services is cultural orientation. Every refugee must complete cultural orientation with the agency they're receiving services from and a JFS that looks like a three hour long class once a week for four weeks. Now I would like to do a quick activity. If everyone could please close their eyes or look down if they're more comfortable with that. Imagine you've just arrived in a new country. Your family is still back home. You've never been here before and you don't speak the language. You have some support, but only for three months. You have to quickly figure out what you need to learn, what resources you need to be able to use and connect with. As you open your eyes, what is one thing that you would want to prioritize if you ever found yourself in a situation like this? Would anyone like to share? Seth. Mm -hmm. How to find food, maybe grocery stores, how to cook, how to use a kitchen here. Another one? Genevieve. Housing, yes. A last one, a third one, Timo. 
healthcare, how to access healthcare, how to deal with health insurance. These are just a sliver of the topics covered in cultural orientation. Um, and immediately as someone arrives here, they're already, already facing these barriers, accessing these services and understanding how to use them. There are also many barriers to the implementation of cultural orientation programming, such as transportation, getting to the class, people's limited to lack of complete knowledge of English, limited digital literacy, limited literacy in their native language, finding childcare for those with children. JFS quickly found that if they didn't provide childcare, women would simply not come. Finding interpreters in all of the languages, sometimes interpreters cancel. What do you do in that situation when you completely cannot communicate with the client? Different levels of base knowledge about the US upon arrival. Some refugees receive pre-departure cultural orientation in their country of origin. Some do not. Some received it like three years ago. Um, also, people just have different learning styles. It's an overwhelming amount of information to digest and dealing with cognitive load is a real issue. The lastly, needing a large space with a place for kids and having limited time. 12 hours is not enough time to teach everyone everything they need to know about living in a new place. This summer, I was lucky to be able to be a part of some of these solutions and to learn about how organizations like JFS solve some of these problems. A big one is partnering with other community organizations for space or resources. Increased grant funding can allow for more staff to be hired to help with running the program. Getting volunteers to work with the kids in the playroom is extremely important so that adults and families can focus on the class itself and not on what's going on with their children. We have regular breaks during which tea, coffee, snacks, and fresh fruit are provided so that people can take a little bit of a breather, people can socialize, can meet each other, and maybe a little bit of a community will form in the cultural orientation classes themselves. Lastly, we try to get interpreters from the refugees communities who are able to relate to their experiences and help them out a little bit more, not just through translation. We implement digital programming and resources. And this summer, and specific, specifically, I've been working on the resource guide, which is a book that like, breaks down everything that people learn in cultural orientation that they're able to take home with them. Here's an example of two community organizations that we partnered with this summer, Westside Community Services and Lafayette High School. We were able to use their spaces. And here's an example of a typical classroom. Each table is grouped by language. So at any given time, there's up to like seven different languages being spoken in a room. Each table has an interpreter and there's a facilitator at the front of the room. You can imagine that this is quite chaotic. There's a lot of things happening. So organization is extremely important. Here's an example of our playroom. The woman up there is Salima, who is also one of my coworkers this summer. Um, and everyone really comes together to make this work. Here's a few pages of the resource guide that I made. I had to really focus on putting as little words as possible because even we are getting it translated, but even when it is translated, we have to consider that some people aren't literate in their native language. So I focus on putting as many pictures as possible. And one of the first things that people learn is how to use a QR code because everyone gets a phone um, so that the QR codes can take them to all the links they may need to use. Um, yeah, here's what someone would come home with. The resource guide right now is I think like 65 pages. Um, and it's constantly being added to as we figure out like, what do people need most. Um, yeah, this was just a bit of my work this summer. I'm very thankful to have worked with Jewish Family Services, and I'm going to pass it on to Kieran Adams. All right. Uh... Hello, my name is Kieran. Uh, I'm from Medford, Massachusetts, and this summer I worked with Preservation Bluff of Niagara. Oh, shit. Um, 
This summer, I focused on a research project about the uprising of 1967 in Buffalo. The uprising lasted for around five days in June, and it was a race riot um, in which uh, members of the east side, the, the traditionally black section of Buffalo, rose up um, in response to problems with schools, policing, uh, ed employment opportunities, and so on. Um, I kind of wanted to talk about what history could be. Um, we're sitting in a pretty stuffy building um, as a monument to, to, to Buffalo's past, but I think um, what I learned this summer at PBN is reframing history instead of um, a prism of perspective. So there's one event of the uprising, but there's many different angles we can look at it from. History is not just dates and names. History is stories, it's narratives, it's emotions, it should evoke anger, it should evoke um, passion in you. And finally, in history, it's not normally one singular struggle. When we talk about black freedom, as I will, it's not one organization, it's a bunch of them. And it, it doesn't always line up because things are generally pretty conflicting. So we'll start with a walk down Jefferson Ave. If you walk down Jefferson Ave in the 1960s, you'd find a bustling street brimming with grocery stores, appliance stores, taverns, um, banks, and the whole nine yards. As the central business and shopping center on the east side, many who remember it compare it to today's Hurdle Avenue. For Buffalonian Mike Quinney, it was an entire shopping district. You didn't even need to go downtown if you lived there because everything was on Jefferson. Behind these storefronts of free commerce and economic prosperity lay a foundation of inequality. White businesses were notorious for overcharging on items. Many rarely hired black employees and often discriminated between black and white applicants in the open. As the East Side Shopping Center during the uprising, Jefferson was struck by looting, fires, and chaos. That also meant it was a site of concentration for the rampant police brutality that had sparked the uprising in the first place. Police, it, it was alive with people and abuse. Police targeted um, loot rioters, bystanders, community responders with indiscriminate force on a Jefferson set ablaze. After the riots, Jefferson accelerated along a path of disinvestment. While the east side was um, diversely packed with southern and eastern European immigrant enclaves, this was quickly changing. Segregationist tactics employed by the banks, the government, property owners, and real estate agents sought to cordon black Buffalonians into certain sections on the east side. Meanwhile, Buffalo suburbs were developing, and highways such as the Kensington Express sliced through black neighborhoods to provide even easier accesses to downtown. These constructs beckoned to white immigrants who sought to escape their second-class status and further distance them themselves from black people. The violence of the riots added extra impetus to leave. Today, Jefferson Ave looks a lot different than it did over 60 years ago. As former common counselor Charlie Fisher explains, why is it that Hurdle Avenue is busting at the seams, but Jefferson Avenue, well, you can shoot a cannon through it? Well, Jefferson did have a riot in 1967. All right. In the summer of 1967, of the many black freedom organizations in Buffalo, two heavy hitters stood out. The NAACP, with its origins in Buffalo, was falling out of its former glory. By the late 60s, their tactics of legal action and legislation failed to curb their diminishing membership and dwindling legitimacy. The reality of Northern racial capitalism couldn't be fought with the same weapons used against Jim Crow in the South. In early 1967, meanwhile, local leaders reached out to the nationally renowned community organizer, Saul Alinsky, to start a coalition for Buffalo. Build. Former Build president, Charlie Fisher remarks, the Saul Alinsky organization was a national group that organized to rub raw the souls of social discontent. In fact, it was a change agent. Build and the NAACP both found themselves in critical positions during the uprising. The NAACP found an opportunity to change their image by seeking out the rioting student insurgents. They met with youth leaders and listened to their concerns about poor schools, lacking recreation facilities, non-existent jobs, and police brutality. They later arranged a mass meeting between these youths and the mayor to bring their concerns to the seat of government. After the riots, NAACP acquired $1,500 in bail funds for those arrested, breaking from their establishment imagery. Build, on the other hand, sought to shut down all disturbances. They sent out volunteers to assist police in patrolling the streets and denounced all forms of unrest. Despite the NAACP's sympathetic shift during the riots, it failed to instill a change in their strategies at large. 
In doing so, however, they threw down a gauntlet to spur Build into action. While Build had rubbed up against the insurgent tactics of the young and unemployed during the uprising, later, they borrowed from youth activists and their freedom schools and the creation of the Build Academy. Both organizations sought to address one of the biggest concerns of the riots, a racist, segregated, and anti-black school system. Build created the Build Academy. It was a unique community-controlled institution um, with a focus on active involvement from parents, child empowerment, and the teaching of black history and literature, all absent from the Buffalo Public Schools. For Build, equity could be achieved by building black power from within. Meanwhile, the NAACP worked to build a legal case towards school-wide desegregation. By 1972, they had won their suit. As a direct consequence, the NAACP spelled doom for the Build Academy. The mandate stripped community control from Build and centralized powers into the hands of the school board. Even more disastrous, desegregation never fully took effect. Widespread white flight and a later reversal of the mandate sent the schools careening back into the same levels of segregation from decades before. And on that note, Thank you, thank you, PBN, and I'm going to pass it to Chinaza. Uh, so a few times during the course of this summer, I've seen fellows look at one another in the best of spirits with the best intentions and say, I do not think we would be friends if it weren't for the fellowship, uh, which is actually kind of incredible, I think. It speaks to the fact that this is a fellowship that brings together a lot of different people with different interests and experiences, and we all get to learn from each other and forge relationships that would not exist if we hadn't all chosen to take the high road. Uh, I think everyone in this room is clear evidence that building a better world is going to take all of us. It's going to take artists, urbanists, organizers, social service workers, and everything that exists in between. It's going to take people who will never shut up about unions, talking to the best biking propagandist I have ever met. <laughs> and maybe together we can find a way forward. So thank you to the High Road Fellow Class of 2023. Uh, but none of that would be possible without the many supervisors in this room that have guided us in our work for the past eight weeks. Uh, when high riders leave our placements, we will leave behind meaningful progress that will aid our organization's goals, but we will have to say goodbye, at least for a, a little while. What will outlast our too brief time in Buffalo, though, are the relationships that we built here. Oops. <laughs> the colleagues, friends, and mentors that we've worked closely with since arriving eight weeks ago. High road supervisors take time out of already packed schedules to accommodate the next generation of activists and organizers, and we've all gained so much from the relationships that we've built with our supervisors. The high road is often a lonely one, especially at institutions like Cornell. Uh, dedicating your life to building a better world is rarely the easy, secure, or profitable path. But every supervisor in this room is a living example of what it looks like to successfully tread that path. And those examples mean the world to us. I've seen firsthand and with conversations with so many fellows uh, the impact our supervisors had on us, and we're all deeply grateful. So let's have another hand for the supervisors of the 2023 class. Um, and last but certainly not least, there are two other very special people that the Gratitude Committee on behalf of the High Road Fellowship want to thank. This summer especially, we've learned that the High Road program is so much more than moving a bunch of interns to a city and calling them a fellowship. It's the pre-course that prepares us for a place most of us have never been before. It's the Wednesday skill shares that help us develop new niche abilities. It's the Friday panels with amazing community leaders. It's the weekly field trips because there is truly so much to explore in Buffalo. It's the constant support and check-ins that so many of us are, have found moved outside our comfort zones through these internships. It is so much more. And none of this would be possible without two very special people. Kathy Creighton and Kristen Kaizek, or as the fellowship call them, Kathy and Cricky. Cricky for constantly making sure we are fed, getting photos of us from our best angles, and for advocating us for us to Cornell. Thank you. With you in our corner, success in this fellowship has felt so much more possible. Kathy, for your witty responses, sage wisdom and experience, and husband who saves us from border control. Thank you. <laughs> Without a doubt, the fellowship can agree that everyone in Buffalo knows Kathy Creighton for a very good reason. 
You two are the glue that you two are the glue that bonds the fellowship together and the foundation of what makes success in the High Road program special. And so the fellowship came together to get you both some tokens of our appreciation in the back. <laughs> <laughs> The people participating in the High Road Fellowship are special. We all just listened to a few presentations from future labor union leaders, future, um, future equitable urban planners, a future en uh, eventually a future engineer, future lawyers, uh, future victims to the Cornell Consulting Pipeline, and <laughs> future education, environmental, transportation, and housing advocates. High Roaders are special because of our unique experience this summer. We've all found new friendships and other fellows. We've all learned about community work through our supervisors, and we've all grown into future community leaders through having Cricky and Kathy as our role models. So to wrap up this gratitude speech, um, members of the High Road Fellowship, supervisors, Cricky and Kathy, and all others who have inspired us over the summer, thank you for taking the High Road. Most amazing thing I've ever got. <laughs> I feel like this is indicative of my personality, so I really appreciate this. Um, and with that, speaking of snacks, um, we are going to have a very brief intermission. Um, as, my, as our fellows know, I like to be extremely punctual. So we will see all of you back at 10.50, just in terms of logistics. There are many bathrooms if you go out this door to the left. Hello. So if you've been listening to the playlist that has been curated by the Arts Opener Committee, it has anything to do with Buffalo, from artists in Buffalo, songs about Buffalo, songs that even mention Buffalo, to songs about actual Buffaloes. So that's what you've been hearing in the background. And if you've seen me outside harassing people about that board, um, that is also an arts uh, committee project. We have cut out a bunch of little buffaloes for everybody to write their name on and where they're from and where they work if they're from Buffalo and stick a little sticky thing on the back of it and then just place it on the high road. So that would be our buffalo herd, high road herd of 2023. <laughs> but yeah, that's all I have to say. The Arts Committee does such incredible work. Thank you so much. Um, each year we offer or award something called the High Road Builders Award. It's an annual tradition where we recognize an individual who has made outstanding contributions to the Cornell ILR High Road Fellowship. We do this along with PPG. Um, we select an awardee who has educated and inspired us through their work uh, and civic engagement. And uh, the awardee for the High Road Fellowship of 2023 is Kate Lockhart from the Western New York Law Center. There she is. Wait, sit out. Stand right next to me, Kate. I got a few things to say about you. Right here. Uh, for those of you don't, who don't know Kate, she is the program director for vacant and abandoned property at the Western New York Law Center. Um, and for the last 10 summers, Kate has taken a high road fellow under her wing to provide them with life changing and life affirming work. Kate didn't seem to realize how she changed people's lives because she's so m humble and modest. Um, she began her career at the Law Center when she was 22 years old as an AmeriCorps volunteer. Um, Joe Kellerman, who created the Western York Law Center, could not be here today, but he asked me to say a few things about Kate. 
Uh, he said, Kate is excellent at her job. Uh, she took the vacant and abandoned property program, revived it, and created a citywide coalition and then a countywide coalition. She also volunteered in, uh, for lobbying in Albany on behalf of their clients, and it turned out she was really good at that also. Uh, Kate is so effective that Joe Kellerman says she is effectively the face of the Western New York Law Center. As a high road supervisor, Kate has impacted every student that she's touched, um, and some of the fellows wrote, to us about Kate. I'm going to quote some of that. Um, bear with me. One student said that her time working with Kate at the Western New York Law Center was without a doubt my single most formative experience of my college career. Kate's enthusiasm for the importance of the project was infectious. She always believed in my ability to do the work, encouraging me and guiding me through the most comprehensive research and writing project I've ever completed. But with Kate's mentorship, it became achievable. Along the way, she demonstrated incredible value of public service work that centers community, and she showed me what local leadership looks like. I'm so grateful that she continues to, lead, to lend her talents and knowledge to the High Road program. Another student said, Kate was an amazing mentor to have with me on the high road. Her enthusiasm for her work and her expertise that she's always willing to share makes her a great person to work with every day. And one more. I'll only quote three students. Um, we have so many. I'm consistently inspired by Kate's commitment to take action and create positive impact in the community around her. She's knowledgeable and intelligent while also being humble and empathetic. I've had a wonderful time working with Kate. I can give no higher praise uh, for Kate than the students have shared, and please join me in congratulating Kate Lockhart uh, as in achieving the High Road Builders Award 2023. I got some things for you. Here's a small gift. Wait, Thank we have you. some more things. Where? We have a card. I'll find them later. It's right. Oh, here it is. Thank you. See, she's so effective. Thank, Thank you, Kate. Appreciate it. All right. All right. Andreina, are you next? I think. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so my name is Andreina, and this summer I had the pleasure of working at the Michigan Street African American Heritage Corridor. This quote is by W.E.B. Du Bois from The Souls of Black Folk. Despite this book being published around 120 years ago in 1903, it has continued to resonate with me throughout my summer here in Buffalo. It reads, to be a poor man is hard, but to be a poor race in a land of dollars is the very bottom of hardships. By referring to the land of dollars, he is, referring, he is referencing the idea that the American dream is capitalism as a system of limitless wealth and economic mobility. However, being black in America is to feel hopelessly excluded from an economic mainstream promised by the American dream. In our pre-course, we learned about the history of segregation in Buffalo. Buffalo is known to be one of the most racially segregated regions in the nation. Of all people who identify as black within the city of Buffalo, roughly 85% leave east of Main Street. The problem of segregation was exacerbated with the construction of highways like the Kensington Expressway, which led to the displacement and limited housing which led to displacement and limited housing for black Buffalonians. This highway ultimately cut the east side community in half, which devastated a large number of black families. Urban renewal projects such as these were very common, tearing down buildings and constructing highways instead. Housing sites such as the Willard Park housing development were built in an effort to remedy the displacement. Willard Park was Western New York's first public housing complex for black people, and it eventually became home to more than 400 families. This housing development is argued to be the beginning of Buffalo's Black East Side and is seen to be the birthplace of segregation in Buffalo. 
Unknown to some, the Colored Musicians Club came into being because of the segregationist practices of the day, specifically the segregation, the racist practices of unions. The club is one out of four cultural anchors of the corridor. It was here that members of the All Black Musicians Local 533 formed in 1917. Here they established their own identity as a result of being excluded from the sole All White Musicians Buffalo Union. From stories told to me by Danny William and George Scott, the current and past presidents of the club, I quickly learned that it was a story of a place that had once been the hub of economic development for Michigan Street. For example, the local had its own credit union, which served the community around Michigan Street. The union was housed in the bottom half of this building while the social club was in the top. The club provided a social hub for this historic black community. Jazz, leg jazz legends such as Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, and Aretha Franklin played here. As a result of desegregation, the club was the local was forced to merge with the white local. Local 533 was immensely run dry after the merger because their money was used to pay off the debts, debts of the white local. Fortunately, the Colored Musicians Club, having purchased the property at Broadway, was able to maintain the building in their uh, ownership. So that is why the building is still standing today. The absence of Local 533 left a hole in the historic community of Michigan Street, which eventually became a, yet another disinvested community here in Buffalo. My work at the corridor has been focused on the economic development of the community. These pictures are renderings of what the club is going to look like after its renovation, which should hopefully finish by December. The corridor was the center of black life in Buffalo for decades. And many important figures in African-American history are tied to the histories of each anchor site. Our mission is to establish a vision for the long-term sustainable operations of the anchors and the commission itself. As W.E.B. Du Bois made clear, the American dream was not made for us black Americans, but we can create our own wealth within the community so that our people and history prosper, especially in times like today where our history is constantly trying to be erased. And that is all. Um, <laughs> um, so hi, my name is Shanaza Politas. I'm a sophomore studying industrial and labor relations. And this summer I was working with the office of New York State Senator Sean Ryan studying building electrification. And um, this summer I got to learn about the importance of legislating a greener future. So today I wanted to share with you all um, some important legislation surrounding climate change in New York. So the biggest piece of climate change legislation in New York is the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, or the CLCP, the CLCPA. Um, it was passed in 2019 and establishes goals for New York State to reach a greener economy, with the ultimate goal being of net zero emissions by 2050. It codifies that 35% of green energy benefits should be reserved for disadvantaged communities and establishes the Climate Action Council responsible for the scoping plan. And as the state transitions off of fossil fuels, it's also very important to understand the state of uh, the gas system in New York as it is. Currently, the gas system in the gas lines in New York are aging rapidly. Uh, there are leak prone pipes which spill gas into the environment and are very, very costly to repair. Over the next 20 years, gas utilities in New York are expected to spend a combined $150 billion repairing these leak-prone pipes. Um, another, another issue within the gas system is that public service law mandates that gas utilities have an obligation to serve whichever customer requests a gas line, and these customers get a gas line installed at no cost to them if they're within 100 feet of an existing 
uh, gas line. This has this um, leads costs to be pushed onto existing ratepayers a total of two hundred million dollars every single year. While utility companies are making an immense profit off of these expansions and repairs. Uh, long story short, the current system has it so that gas utilities are incentivized to expand their network and all ratepayers are complicit in the pollution that these companies are causing. However, the recently passed New York Heat Act changes all of this. It caps um, energy bills at 6% of the income of low to moderate income ratepayers and um, eliminates many gas subsidies by repealing the legislation that has promoted the gas system's expansion. Ending the 100-foot rule alone will save families an estimated $70 to $80 per month on their energy bills. Um, ultimately, this allows for gas utilities to re redirect their funds into safer alternatives, for safer alternatives to pipes and um, neighborhood-wide electrification pro projects. Uh, thanks to legislative updates, we're one step closer to a greener future. Um, there are two takeaways I'd like to leave the audience with today. Firstly, I'd like to highlight some appreciation for the different environmental groups in New York that are keeping an eye on legislation and calling out aging legislation that is standing in the way of a green future. Climate action is not simple. Um, we need more than the CLCPA promises. We need people to be watching the legislation that's happening and ensuring that it's being enforced to, its, to the fullest. The second thing I'd like to leave you all with today is, the, is to highlight that climate action is no longer a simple act. Uh, one of the organizations that I got to interview this summer offered me this example. Getting people to go green with LED light bulbs was a simple action. You just had to put it on the shelves, make it cheap, and do a short educational campaign, and suddenly everyone has LED light bulbs and the climate crisis has been averted. Getting people to go green with building electrification has been much more complex. Ground source heat pumps are costly and messy. Air source heat pumps are costly and less reliable. Insulation takes a lot of time, and before that, you need basic home repairs, which has been a major issue for many Western New York homes. And on top of that, you may need to be updating your homes or your entire neighborhood's electrical system, which can be an unexpected and extremely unpredictably high cost. And to make all of this possible, the power grid needs to be um, expanding its renewable energy resources to meet the new electricity demands. So the question remains, how do we get thousands of homes that were built in New York before most people in this room were born to adopt a technology that was made in the past decade? As I said before, there's no simple answer to this. But we do know that each and every one of these problems has an individual solution. The only questions left are, how long are we going to drag our feet? And what barriers are we going to let stand in the way of a green economy? This summer, the High Road Fellowship has learned about coalition building. Climate change affects us all, whether we realize it now or realize it later. And it's only through complex coalitions that these complex problems can be tackled in order to transition to a future of complex solutions. Thank you. Now I'd like to pass it to Bridget. So this, oh, is it working? Okay. <laughs> this summer, I worked with the Foundry. Um, I got to collect stories through taking photos um, and conducting interviews to make uh, a longer video, kind of documentary style, for their 10th anniversary. So the Foundry is really, really amazing. I've never seen a place like this. I don't think any of you have, unless you've been there. Um, they are home to five maker spaces. So we have a textile lab, a tech lab, a metal shop, a wood shop, and a digital fabrication lab. Um, I made these in the metal shop yesterday. They're garden stakes. Um, we also offer after school programming. This was um, 
used the project for one of our after school programs this year. So I think we're still selling them. But um, <laughs> the foundry is a place of possibility and creativity and opportunity. Um, and getting to speak with so many different people there taught me a few things about human connection and also about self-empowerment. And I think that those two things are um, intricately connected. We can't, we can't create and we can't um, really access who we are without a community behind us. So um, I decided to create a song. Um, I'm gonna show you the lyrics. Oh wait, first we're gonna talk about this. Sorry, I, I got nervous. Okay, um, so here's some stuff that I learned. Okay, so existence is a process. We're changing at every moment. And um, it's important to consider that with all of our actions and all of the things that we surround ourselves with. And it means that it's never too late to learn how to do something or to change. You can't expect people to be who you think they are. I found it was really important to give people space in the interviews to come as who, who they really are. And um, it was important to really listen and understand without trying to assume something about them or assume what their story is. Um, finally, in order to get someone else to open up, be vulnerable. Um, and with that being said, I'm going to be vulnerable and show you these lyrics because that's, yeah. So here are, I'm just going to give you a couple seconds on each one. And then we're going to go to a different video where you can actually hear the song that I recorded in Timo's room last night. Shout out, Timo. Thank you. Okay.
Can everyone hear me? Okay. Hope everyone is living, laughing, and learning a lot through these presentations. Today, I will be providing a quick crash course on social emotional learning. For some background, every year, one in every five children are diagnosed with a mental health illness or disorder. And this was a concerning trend even before the COVID pandemic, but the pandemic made it even worse. So anxiety and depression rates in children soared by 26% in the years from 2016 to 2020. Clearly, now more than ever, our children need social and emotional support. This brings us to an educational concept called social emotional learning. So social emotional learning or SEL is not a mental health intervention. Rather, it is a tool designed to promote strong human development and address mental illness. Now, SEL is a term that was coined in the 90s. So you may feel that you are not too familiar with it, but in reality, it has been a long part of American school curriculums. It has been known by other names such as character development, growth mindset, mindfulness, and the list goes on. So basically, SEL is a really broad term that teaches students how to manage their emotions, build healthy relationships, just to name a few. So here's an example of how SEL works. Say you're working on some math homework and you come across this really hard math problem and you just don't know how to get started. You don't know what the first step is. You're completely stuck. You have to be self-aware enough to recognize that you're getting really frustrated and that it would be a good time to seek help from a friend, a teacher, or someone who loves math more than we do. That's how simple SEL is. Literally any situation at a school involves SEL to some extent. Now, here are some common myths about SEL. So first of all, as mentioned earlier, SEL is not a mental health intervention. SEL was not designed to meet the unique and individual needs of every student. Uh, rather, it is a tool designed for instructors to recognize some signs of negative mental health and redirect students to the appropriate treatments. Uh, second of all, SEL should not be replacing any instructional time. Rather, it should be embedded into academics. This can look like daily gratitude, uh, check-ins before class starts, and doing reflective practices during class discussions. Now, SEL sounds really great, right? But it has actually been a source of immense political controversy in recent years. Many parents and community members have been fighting against SEL because of its connection to another controversial concept in public education, critical race theory. The idea that race is a social construct and racism is a systemic issue rather than an individual one. Uh, due to this connection to SEL, despite SEL, Despite this connection to critical race theory, although SEL has, uh, is not political in any way, um, this has had real consequences in some states. Just earlier this year um, in Iowa, lawmakers proposed a bill to ban the Iowa Department of Education to stop promoting um, SEL in its schools. And similar events have happened in other states such as Florida, Georgia, and Wisconsin. Now, given that the fight against SEL is ongoing, this raises the question, how can educators overcome the attacks on SEL? Well, in one school district in Virginia, parents were rallying against SEL due to its connection to critical race theory. But a few months later, the school board passed a resolution to continue using SEL in its schools. What changed? Well, the school board members had taken the time to talk to the parents individually and clarify any misconceptions they had about SEL. This shows just how essential parent education, educated, edu educator co communication is um, for SEL. We have to have one-on-one -on -one conversations, go to SEL workshops together, and most importantly, listen to each other. It is through listening to each other in any way that we can really discover and realize just how amazing and impactful SEL is. Thank you for listening, and I'll pass the mic to Adam. <laughs> what Partnership for the Public Good is, and Partnership for the Public Good is a community-based
think tank organization that works to provide research and advocacy support to a broad range of over 300 plus partners. And one theme that followed the work I did this summer was really pushing for democracy. And one way we do that is through each year, allowing our partners to use democratic processes to create a community agenda. So to start, I had three main focuses. My first focus being to research community benefits agreements nationwide and look at successful models to consider possible applications for a community benefits ordinance for Erie County. Secondly, I built a survey to aid with the refreshing of PPG's founding principles, the principles that all community organizations agree to sign on to when they join us as a partner. And then lastly, I evaluated the workplace practices of local organizations and organizations nationwide to determine whether or not they were more or less democratic, basically whether or not they were more horizontal or vertically structured. So I want to clarify a few terms before we go any further. A community benefits agreement, basically a CBA, is an agreement between a developer and a community organization that represents local residents. Meanwhile, a community benefits ordinance is basically just a requirement for a CBA before a developmental project takes place. So let's jump into my takeaways. My first takeaway is focused on developer accountability. So how can we hold developers accountable? This can be done through recognizing the importance of CBAs. CBAs have the ability to improve local communities through development projects, provide and equip residents with stronger agency and planning processes, and they can help address community concerns through legal mechanisms, making sure that any development projects are in line with the community. Secondly, I learned that it's important to listen to local communities and adjust our actions accordingly. So one way I learned this is through building the PPG partner survey that I focused on. And I really had to consider um, the, the types of questions that I was building were in line with that. So a few questions that I, that I included in the form were uh, related to our greatest community assets in Buffalo, Niagara region, our greatest challenges, and whether or not partners that we work with really wanted to get involved to help us refresh our founding principles. And lastly, I learned that it's important to advocate for advancing democracy in all contexts of life, not just on the government level, but also in relationship building and also within workplaces. So the best workplaces are workplaces that look horizontal. So they have leadership that's distributed evenly and everyone has the ability to collaborate and push for new perspectives that can push for outcomes and changes that, that make change. And these are the workplaces that do the most meaningful work and are the most collaborative. So why do these things matter? I want to take a step back and really look at what a community benefits ordinance might look like for Erie County. And through that, I'm going to share with you an example of a successful model in Detroit, Michigan. So with that, Detroit had 11 total projects that were in progress and completed through passing a community benefits ordinance. And they had systems in line where they were able to track progress and finances on these and recognize them as on or off track. And so for instance, one development is Detroit's Lafayette West, which was an affordable housing development that received $150 million in subsidies. And it was a 318 unit condo minimum apartment community with 213 apartments and 88 condos with a total of 82% progress made thus far. And this is what the expected outcome looked like. So that said, for Erie County, if we can pass a community benefits ordinance, we might be able to see some really cool development projects that are in line with the community and push for change um, and, and ensure further vibrancy in our community. And that would allow us to prevent harmful developments from being made that aren't in line with the community. That would allow us to carefully consider potential negative outcomes and receive public support and approval of these developments to strengthen our communities. Thank you so much, and I'm going to pass it off to Adrian. Thank you. Hello? All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Audrey Yan, and I'm really excited to talk to you about what I did at my project placement with New York State Assembly Member John Rivera this summer. Okay, so what makes a neighborhood nice as opposed to not nice? 
I think that these terms are frequently used by people when we first go to a neighborhood and we use it to categorize certain neighborhoods to be nicer than other neighborhoods. But this categorization isn't something that I really dwelled upon until I was quite literally forced to this summer with my project. When I first went to Grand Street, which is where the office that I worked at was located, I had to go through Elmwood Village. And I remember when I first went through Elmwood Village, I thought that it was so nice. It was pristine, there was a lot of nature, a lot of foot traffic. I thought that this was the kind of place that I want to come back to one day. And then three minutes later, I went into Grand Street thinking the opposite. I thought, hmm, this isn't the nicest neighborhood. Afterwards, my supervisor asked me to share with her my first impressions of Grand Street, and I told her exactly that. And we had a really important discussion about how certain neighborhoods are nice not just because, but how there are fundamental reasons as to why certain neighborhoods might seem to be nicer than others. So while at first glance, these are the things up there that we might first notice, the really important things that we need to focus on, especially in terms of policy, are the in-depth differences. Is there investment, policy attention? What is the demographic like? Are there community groups, volunteer events, community morale? These are the factors that we need to focus on when organizing our community, and these were actually the factors that were lacking in Grand Street, and that was precisely what my project aimed to focus on. So this summer, my job was to create a community organization that would manage the distribution of funds that Grand Street receives, serve as an advocate for members of the community, a local point of contact that property and business owners could come to when they have any questions, and also an organization that could host community events to boost community morale. Now, of course, this is much easier said than done, so it took a total of eight weeks to get all of this done. First step was research. I looked into if an organization like this was feasible or if this was something that would be a good idea for Grant Street. I also looked into vacant properties, how much this would cost. I did all the nitty gritty work of what starting an organization like this would actually entail. Next step was stakeholder meetings. I reached out to a variety of stakeholders who had a lot of expertise in leadership and community organizing, and I talked to them about the feasibility of this project. And lastly was writing the proposal. Overall, I submitted about 10 to 11 pages full of, again, the nitty gritty foundational information that was needed to start an organization like this. And just a couple days ago, I was able to finish it and pitch it to my assembly member. Now, this was definitely not a smooth process and there were quite a few challenges along the way. First were opponents of the proposal. So I naively thought that no one would oppose this proposal because why would they? I mean, we're trying to help people, right? But certain people thought that by us proposing this organization, we were discounting previous volunteer efforts or telling people that what they were doing currently wasn't enough. So, balance, so balancing those concerns while also promoting our organization and talking about how our organization can do so much good in the community was a difficult balance to achieve. Next was stakeholder meetings. I'm sure we all know people don't respond to emails, so that was a little bit difficult to coordinate, but overall it worked out. And lastly was proposal implementation. Now, this is a challenge that is still in the works. Actually getting funding to get this project up and running is going to be a challenge now and in the near future, but I really hope that it comes into fruition. Now, to end this presentation, I want to reflect back on a Friday get-together that me and all the other fellows had on week two. And our supervisors asked us to reflect so far on our experience, and I was a Debbie Downer and said that I have never felt more pessimistic in my life. Six weeks later, I can positively say that I am leaving Buffalo tomorrow with a little bit more hope left. You see, community organizing is not easy, and we're not in this fight because it's easy, we're in it because it's good and because it's important. But something really important that I've learned this summer through this experience is that sometimes, even when hope is, seems lost, you can find it. And if there aren't other people that can instill that hope within you, then you yourself have to be a change maker and instill that hope within yourself. And I think that this lesson is not something that I could just carry on within the scope of Buffalo, but something that will follow me for the rest of my life. So I encourage every single person in this room, when you feel like you have a challenge and you, when you feel like there is hope lost, then I encourage you to find that hope within yourself and be the light. Thank you so much. Okay. Hey, can everybody hear me okay? Awesome. I'm very hungry and it's hot in here, which is like my <laughs> kryptonite, so wish me luck.
Um, so hey friends, I'm Timo. Um, I chose the high road because I wanted to find economic alternatives, creative ones to a lot of the socioeconomic issues that we've been talking about today. And um, before I came to college, I went to a six through 12 art school back in uh, Portland, Oregon, where I'm from. And so I thought uh, the Buffalo Center for Arts and Technologies youth arts team would be a perfect placement for me. Little did I know, it is a lot harder being on the other side than I anticipated. Um, and so I really wanted today to show you what the work is like that the youth arts team put in um, through my eyes because I documented uh, a lot of the program with a camera like this in front of my eyes. Um, first, I'm going to start with my direct supervisor who is here, Matthew Bosque, a college and career counselor. And ostensibly in this role, he just uh, prepares the kids for their future, for college, career planning and counseling, as his title implies. But he also sends out bus passes daily, um, distributes uh, BCAT IDs to the kids so that they can get their first government ID, um, and also writes grants because BCAT's grant writing team isn't writing the grants. It's definitely the youth arts team writing a lot of the grants. Um, we have Callie Lewis, the social worker um, who counsels youth on personal issues at home or at school, but also does a lot of domestic labor, stocking all the food, maintaining common areas, managing inventory and supplies. Then there's Kevin Klein, curriculum and instructional coordinator, uh, designs curricula for all the classes, but also teaches his own class, documents other classes when I'm not around, and generates marketing media, taking headshots of the kids for IDs. Um, and lastly, the director of the Youth Arts and Technology team, Dr. K, uh, manages the finances and budget, but also uh, is called the hammer because of her background in restorative discipline. Um, sometimes supports the separate and understaffed adult workforce program. Um, and all of their work together helps turn BCAT into more of a social institution. Excuse me while I flip to the card that says social institution. Okay. Um, at BCAT, youth get a major support system as they tee up to the next phase of their life. While I was there, I saw, you know, a course on sex ed in partnership with Planned Parenthood. Um, of course, the distribution of IDs. Uh, eventually, Matt will be taking a bunch of the kids to the DMV to get their first ever government ID. Um, and also tours to arts and cultural centers around the city so that kids can see what it's like to actually continue pursuing um, life in the arts after high school. Um, but most of all, what I saw was a community that affirms that the youth art is, uh, that their youth art is valued and offers them methods and opportunities to be successful artists. Now, it's no secret that capitalism is not kind to artists. In fact, as an artist, it sucks. Um, but in the storm that threatens to destroy the last vestiges of self-directed creativity, BCAT stands as a shelter for Buffalo youth starting to come into their own. Um, so this internship was very emotionally hard, but documenting it reminded me of its purpose. As I watched my colleague go through the most intense domestic, domestic and personal labor, the kind of work that couldn't possibly ever find financial compensation, um, I still now understand why they all told me that they love their job, even if sometimes they hate the work. Um, and that's because their work fosters a vibrant community of teens who are supported in expressing themselves in a very material way, an education of their own abilities and power, not an education where you're lectured at for an hour and a half about sociology of organizations or something like that. I don't know, just my personal experience, maybe, I don't know. Um, now, BCAT isn't perfect. It takes so much out of the youth arts team to do work that, honestly, in my opinion, I think the government should be providing. And maybe the private system holds them back in a lot of ways. Um, but the fact that they're so successful is a testament to the hard work of the youth arts team at BCAT uh, in equipping youth with the tools, the creative and critical understanding needed to face and one day uproot the oppressive systems in their life. Maybe not right away, but in due time, and meanwhile, they won't be beat by the system because they can envision alternatives to it. So in conclusion, the biggest lesson that I learned was that in the face of oppression, the act of creation itself is emancipatory. And with that, thank you. And I'll pass it off to Genevieve. Thank you. Hi, everyone. 
I'm Genevieve Galluccio, and this summer I had the privilege of working with the Massachusetts Avenue Project, which is a food justice nonprofit on the west side of Buffalo. One of my most inspiring takeaways from this summer working with MAP has been seeing MAP's role as an intermediary with the local food system, such as small and mid-sized farmers and the greater Buffalo community. The work of MAP and other food initiatives here in Buffalo attest to the capabilities of locavorism, a term which refers to a diet which consists only or principally of locally grown or produced food. Today, I'd like to reflect on some of the key ways in which I see local food as having a real impact in meeting the needs of its community members. So first, I'd like to reflect on local food as community building. During one of my first weeks at MAP, the organization hosted the Empty Bowls Community Dinner an event which centered around connecting people through a shared meal, expressing gratitude for what we have, and thinking about and raising funds for those in our community who go with empty bowls. This event and keeping this sentiment in mind, I really feel set the precedent for the rest of my summer and how I would reflect on how food can play a role in community building and fighting inequities here in Buffalo. I, like many other people in this room, know the warm feeling that comes from sharing a meal that feels culturally significant to one's family. A large part of MAP's farm philosophy is growing foods that are culturally relevant to the diverse ethnic communities that make Buffalo such a strong city. Other organizations that do similar work are Push Buffalo and Grassroots Gardens, which provide residents even more autonomy in having a space to grow the produce that matters to them. Next, I'd like to reflect on local food as a place-based solution to inequities. As I'm sure it's of no surprise to most people in this room, Buffalo is a city that's impacted by a history of discrimination and redlining, which has resulted contemporarily in food deserts across the city most clearly evidenced in the tops on Jefferson Avenue being the only commercial grocery store to service the entirety of the east side of Buffalo. Throughout the summer, I've been inspired through the various initiatives such as the African American Heritage Co-op, the Healthy Corner Store Initiative, as well as MAP's own mobile market trucks, which have all worked to fit different gaps left by a discriminatory food system. Next, as a labor student at heart, I'd like to reflect on the labor of local food. As I've heard, one of my lovely supervisors, Katie, who I worked with on MAP's urban farm this summer, exalt on more than one occasion the importance of knowing one's farmer. So what does it mean to know one's farmer? Knowing one's farmer means having information to soil testing in a city with high levels of lead poisoning. Knowing one's farmer means having information on the labor standards on that farm. How are the farm workers that are growing the food that you're eating each night being treated? Knowing one's farmer means having a stake in Buffalo's climate future, as industrial agriculture has proven to be one of the most destructive elements to our environment. To conclude, my summer at MAP has taught me about the role that food plays in building community and creating a more equitable future here in Buffalo an experience that has proven to be both appeasing to the, to the taste buds and perspective shifting. I wanna thank my lovely supervisors, Katie, Bethany, Sarah, and Karine for making my summer at MAP so memorable. Next, I'm going to pass it to Asher Kai. <laughs> My name's yeah. 
Uh, hello guys, uh, my name is Asher. So this summer I worked really closely with my manager, Russell Weaver, on digital equity in New York State. Uh, it was a great experience and uh, my project's a little quantitative based. So if you want to see numbers, now is a good time. Um, so what do we have done? We basically made a portal. Um, I know there's a lot of information, but just give you guys a ballpark. Uh, before we jump right into the proto, I want to show you guys what exactly is digital equity. Uh, it's a fairly new term that catch people's attention since COVID-19. Uh, once people start to work remotely and uh, students start to learn their class remotely, people start to understand the importance of people to access of technology and internet. So as technology has penetrated and saturated every aspect of a social, political, economical, and personal life, and the ability certainly to access digital uh, portal is very important. Um, so this time we did a little different. We break down uh, our data into 350,000 blocks. That means a lot of data, a lot of fields. So one of the first things that will computers and PCs to run day and night for this product, even though they're not here. Um, so here's the data. Um, just in case you don't know, um, the green means good, and uh, the yellow and orange means not so good. Um, <laughs> we can see that in metropolitan area like New York City, Buffalo, and uh, Rochester, we're doing pretty good. But in the southwest part of the New York State, we're not having that much access. Um, this is a more number-focused data. So as you can see, the first one's incomes um, versus internet access percentage. The, usually the trend is the more income you have, the more stable and uh, larger access of internet you will have. The second is in journal New York State people, 10.7% do not have board and uh, board by internet. That means they cannot access uh, internet, Google Chrome, and all the fun stuff that we use every day. Uh, that gives us uh, 800,000 people, which is a great amount that we need to deal with. Um, so how's our Buffalo doing? Our Buffalo is doing pretty great. Uh, it's, a, it's doing a good job. We're only facing 5.8, which is much less than 10.7, uh, no born access to internet. And as you can see, on uh, the west, Buffalo kind of have more access to internet, but the east side of Buffalo, less so. And um, what we found is mainly three things. Uh, the very first thing is, who is the demographic that's missing uh, the access to the internet? Uh, we have them in elderly persons, 40% uh, of them don't have. In poor neighborhoods, 50% of them don't have. In minority communities, which stand at 33% uh, of the population. We also find some great endeavor to solve these problems. Uh, we have Proto Network, which is basically a suitcase you can carry and just put it in one place and the whole neighborhood will have the access to the internet. We, have, we also have independent company work on cables in terms of citywide cables and citywide fibers to help local people to have access to the internet. And the last thing is that wanna, we found out data technology are very important tools for us to understanding what's happening in a country in the state or even just in the neighborhood. So if you want to visit on the New York State Digital Equity Portal, uh, you can just scan the QR code. More work is being done. Uh, once again, I want to send uh, Rusty for helping with me on this project. Thanks, guys. And now we'll pass it to Nick Wilson. In the second last one, we're staying a little more energized. Everything's great. My name is Nick Wilson. I'm from Evanston, Illinois. I'm at Chicago. I'm going to my second year at the School of Industrial and Labor Relations, which is with a minor in education. Uh, I spent the last eight weeks working with Workers United Upstate New York and Vermont. Uh, and I'm going to be talking to you today about our first contract campaign at the Lexington Co op. 
Uh, but before that, uh, exactly a year ago, I would be just about waking up from my post-work nap after an opening shift at Starbucks. Uh, I would not have gotten that job or become the people a lot of you know as Union Nick uh, if it were not for really courageous actions here in Buffalo by the folks involved in starting Starbucks Workers United. Jazz and Will are here today, but Casey, Gary, Richard, Vic, Jasmine, Michelle, Colin, and all of the wonderful people I've had the opportunity to meet out here are not. Uh, so I'd just like to thank them before I move forward. Uh, so first contracts. Um, there's been a national wave of new organizing. Thanks, guys. Um, and it's been sort of a national focus shift now to what do we do next? What happens after the exciting moment of an election win? Uh, and that's the fight for a first contract, which is oftentimes longer, more drawn out, and complex, difficult to understand. Uh, back. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons for that. The biggest one is that though employers have a legal obligation to bargain in good faith with a union, the only enforcement mechanism for that amounts effectively to a strongly worded letter from the labor board, which does not compel managers to move rapidly. Uh, to quote one of the managers that I sat directly across the table from this summer in a statement I can't really understand, uh, we believe strongly that time is relative. Uh, mark your calendars, everyone. I'm about to agree with management. Uh, time is relative. Uh, time passes very, very slowly for people who have to go to work every day and put up with hold this. Oh, yeah. And have to put up with the employment conditions that they're subject to. But time moves very, very quickly for people who are able to take a salary and accommodate the bargaining process as just a minor extra thing in their day. Uh, so first contract campaigns generally move uh, relatively slowly. Um, only about 50% are resolved in the first year. Uh, so unions have to take up the mantle and apply more pressure. And I'm going to highlight some elements of Lexington Co-op Workers United's campaign for a first contract. <laughs> uh, they won their election back in December 2022 pretty overwhelmingly. Uh, it's about 120 grocery store workers here in Buffalo between two stores. Um, and since then, they've been bargaining for a first contract with management at the co-op. Uh, Lexington Co-op is a consumer-owned co-op, so it's owned by around 18,000 member owners here in Buffalo. Uh, but it's managed by a board of directors and a general manager that made decisions during the bargaining process. So the first element that I wanted to highlight from our campaign strategy at the co-op was what I'm referring to as an inside-outside strategy. Uh, there's maybe a motive when we move from the on-the-ground shop floor process of organizing to this more detached idea of bargaining, something that happens at a table, that these things are completely distinct. Uh, and that's not the case, I think. Um, organizing on the ground has to only intensify uh, and amp up in order to sustain the pressure that got management to the bargaining table in the first place. And that's exactly what happened at the co-op, I think. Um, as uh, there had sort of been stalled out, slowed down negotiations. Uh, early in my time out here, we put together a leafleting campaign that reached out to those member owners by talking to them outside stores. And we offered up just basic facts about what was happening in bargaining. Did you know that management does not want to allow front end workers to wear shorts during the heat of summer? These are things that the progressive shoppers who chose the Lexington Co-op over Wegmans or Tops were very apt to say, that's crazy, I support the union, I'm gonna write an email to the general manager. After a lot of people did, uh, both generated some progress uh, in bargaining. We're going to have shorts. Um, but also uh, it sort of caused a pretty rapid panicked email from the general manager assuring the member owners that they were bargaining in good faith. Everything was fine. Nothing to see here. Uh, second, I want to talk about setting the tone. Uh, I promise I'll get to that. Uh, the most important thing that changes when you unionize your workplace uh, before you get a contract, before you get any material gains, I think, is there's a shift in the power dynamic in the workplace. Uh, suddenly, uh, you know, most workplaces are operated fundamentally like a dictatorship. Uh, management is able to dictate terms to workers. Uh, they have no true recourse against that action other than to speak up and risk retaliation. When you have a union, workers suddenly have the collective power of their coworkers behind them, which is extremely potent. Um, and so I wanted to highlight, this is Phil, who's on our bargaining committee, uh, hard styling, stanced up next to a statue in the uh, corporate management side law firm that we did bargaining at. Uh, I think the bargaining process involving workers directly gave people the opportunity to look their boss's boss's boss in the eye when they characterized their employment conditions and say, that's bullshit and you know it, uh, which is extremely powerful. I'd like you all to take a second and imagine your worst boss, hopefully not a higher ed supervisor, being able to say that and knowing that you have your union behind you to protect you and that you're forging a better future for you and your coworkers. Uh, it's a big deal. So funny image, but not frivolous. Uh, and finally, uh, what I'm referring to categorically is vibe maintenance. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, the organizing process does not stop when we enter bargaining. Um, and people still have to remain engaged, in tune to what's happening. Uh, this is something I was less involved in, but I think the co-op workers and organizers at Workers United did a great job of, of supplying regular updates 
uh, giving people information about what was happening in bargaining and ensuring that people were the right mix of outraged and energized to keep the bargaining process moving forward. Uh, it was really impressive to watch um, and super cool to work with. Um, so uh, community support is still a cornerstone of the strategy at Lexington Co-op, though I would say we are extremely close, not quite there yet, um, and support from progressive community members who believe that the co-op deserves a union with a strong contract are always helpful. Uh, so I'd invite you to follow the Lexington Co-op Workers United uh, Union on Twitter and Instagram, uh, and you know, reach out, talk to any of us if you're interested in getting more involved. But thank you so much, and I'll hand it off to our final presenter of the night, Lila. Lila Tausen Fox. I am a rising sophomore at Cornell, and I'm currently studying mechanical engineering, which makes me the first and maybe last um, high road fellow to ever be an engineer. Uh, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see if Kathy and Kirky want to let another one of us into the program after all of this. So. This summer, I was placed with the Community Foundation for Greater Buffalo, and me and my supervisor, Kara, set out to you know, solve climate change. Um, and uh-oh, I have some bad news. It didn't happen, um, but in all seriousness, this summer, I focused on writing a three-part report on climate change. The first part was the what's happening. That was sort of looking into the impacts and particularly how this region of Western New York will be impacted. The second part was who's doing what? Who are the big players? What's the policies, the projects, the organizations that are trying to make change in this space? And ultimately, those two steps were to set me up to think of possible next steps for the Community Foundation. What role can they take in this collective battle? And if you guys really squint, <laughs> that's my report down there. Um, but I'm not going to be focusing on that today. Um, as I acclimated more to Buffalo and just did more research, I realized the goal of the summer for me was to understand the climate of Buffalo. And I mean that in all the senses, pun intended, not only the rising temperatures or the increased rates of precipitation, but also what's the culture, what is the history, what is the personality of Buffalo, how does Buffalo move, what makes Buffalo, Buffalo. So through pictures I've taken throughout these past two months, I'm going to paint this picture. I'm going to emphasize some of the very scary, very real climate change impacts and sort of contrast them with all the beauty of Buffalo. This is not a problem solution format. It's rather look at these scary problems, but also look at the promise of Buffalo, look at why it's so worth protecting. So this is the climate of Buffalo. Precipitation levels are increasing five to 15% each year. And flooding is becoming a more imminent threat, particularly for the 28% of Buffalonians that live on a floodplain. And due to the racism that is entrenched in the layout of our cities, flooding disproportionately affects black communities. But the population of Buffalo is also increasing for the first time in 70 years. And refugees are revitalizing and re-energizing and adding vibrance to the city. Buffalo was home to some of the most severe winter storms. Uh, this past Christmas storm dumped, I think, 52 inches of snow on the city. And with 70% of the housing being over 100 years old, we're really not equipped to handle these storms as they creep further and further into the extremes. But Buffalo is also home to one of the most amazing art scenes. It has 50 local museums and over 130 murals throughout the city. And these murals are being used as a way to reinvest in communities that were historically disinvested in by racist redlining. And this is one of those murals in downtown taken, this picture is taken by our very own Logan. Um, there is an unprecedented presence of harmful algae blooms in Lake Erie. And these algae blooms rob the lake of its nutrients, its oxygen, they create dead zones, and, and they make um, the lake a threat to aquatic and human life. But there is an unprecedented presence of grassroots organizations. In Buffalo alone, I think there's close to 7,000 nonprofits, and um, you can really make change at a local level like nowhere else. This is ground zero. The waves crashing on the Lake Erie shore are increasing bluff erosion rates. This past winter, there was a 20-foot seiche that really just demolished the outer harbor. And in certain areas, bluff recession is approaching two to three feet per year. But the waves of optimism that ripple through the community inform action. Buffalonians have a sense of pride in where they're from. They don't only see Buffalo as it is now, but they can see Buffalo as what it could be. And I think being in this room with everyone is really a testament to that. 
And so we feel the warmth as average temperatures continue to rise. And a recent study predicted that by the year 2100, if these current patterns continue, the average temperatures could have risen like 11 degrees. But we also feel the warmth of the kind hearts of the people that make up the city of good neighbors, people that will return your wallet to the police department without taking any money out of it if you were to lose it at 8.30 PM on a Saturday in Prospect Park, per se. So all of this isn't to say that just because Buffalo has an amazing parkway and the bisons, chicken wings, that um, climate change isn't a very serious threat. Climate change is now when we must act now, and if our next steps aren't decisive and effective and center equity, climate change will continue to claim lives and perpetuate inequities. But I also just wanted to emphasize that as much as climate change is real, the power, the beauty, and the resilience of Buffalo is also real. Thank you. And I know there's probably some sort of youthful term for this where you give people their props, but I'm going to ask all the fellows just to stand one more time so we can give them some recognition. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. So we have now arrived at the place where, our, where we end our words of all the things we have named and not. It was not our intention to leave anything out. If something was forgotten, we leave it to each individual to send such greetings and thanks in their own way. I, for one, am humbled and hopeful. You are a fiercely intelligent, kind, and inquisitive group. We hope that you continue to choose the high road, that you remember that we are stronger together, and that you believe in your very core that change starts with you. Thank you.